So today we're gonna to hear about the Victory 2020 Garden Program. Um, and this was a wild, wildly successful, as I touted it earlier, um, extension program that was set up to be for Florida. And you will not believe how widespread it actually turned out to be. And our presenters today are Erin Harlow. Uh, she is a commercial and a residential. So, so she's horticulture extension agent in Columbia County. And she's also an interim um, pesticide office expert. I'm gonna let her elaborate on that for us. Also, we have Maxine Hunter presenting to us today. She is extension agent in Marion County and master gardener coordinator. And we also have Tia Silvasi from Orange County Extension. She is the Florida friendly landscaping agent and edibles expert as well down there. So welcome you all. We're so thrilled that you're here and we're excited to get going with this. So Erin, I understand you are kicking us off. I am and Tia is gonna go ahead and bring up our presentation for us. Um, as we kind of get going. And, and I'll kind of reintroduce myself as uh, she's doing that. So like Wendy said, um, my name is Erin Harlow. I'm the horticulture agent here in Columbia County. I was in Duval County um, before this, working with their landscapers and professionals. And I see several of my Duval um, master gardeners that I know and recognize and, and miss greatly. So I just want to say hi to them, uh, shout out. But I'm also the master gardener coordinator in Columbia County. Uh, and then I also am the interim uh, pesticide uh, information office um, agent over in Alachua in Gainesville, the state office. Uh, and I think you guys have heard Dr. Brett Boltemeyer speak before. And so I work with, um, with Brett. But uh, today I'm gonna to talk about, um, I'm gonna start us off with the Victory Gardens and, uh, and then let Tia and Maxine jump in in just a few minutes uh, and they can reintroduce themselves. But we work, we're representing a group, I should say, today. So we're representing 12 uh, extension agents and faculty, uh, the three of us are. So Tia, if you want to go ahead and go to my first slide. So I want to just, um, just to talk about the program as a whole first, okay, and kind of give you an idea of what it is. Uh, and, and everybody knows the pandemic happened, obviously. We kind of went lockdown in March. Um, and you know, everybody's stuck at home. The extension agents, we can't get to, to our master gardeners. We couldn't get to the public. Um, you know, my master gardeners couldn't, just like you guys, couldn't get to the public to answer questions. And so we were really sitting around going, oh my goodness, how are we going to keep programming going, right? As this pandemic is moving forward, it looks like we're in it for the long haul here. Um, people still have questions and obviously it was gardening season so we knew that it was really going to be our busy season and and we needed a way for to, to connect with people to be honest and so um, we weren't the only ones I mean this was happening across the state and so today we're highlighting our program uh, that we put together but I wanted to to just mention you know you may have something very similar in your county uh, or in your area. Uh, and so it wasn't just this program, it was successful, but I think a lot of them have been. So uh, I know even Wendy's group, there's a, a new state website uh, that they had launched that kind of houses a lot of, of all of our information and that's the sustainable food um, production website. So just keep that in mind as we kind of move forward, we're just sharing our little story today. Uh, but you may have a, a one in your area as well that you could either get involved with or, um, you know, you're welcome to promote ours and join ours uh, as well. So we, we decided to start, and this was fairly early on, I mean, within the week of, of kind of things shutting down. Um, and it happened separately, actually. So in, in uh, Ocala, where, Marion, uh, where Maxine is from, then uh, in Marion County, she really, her group was saying, okay, we need to come up with something. They had a, a gardening program already, but they wanted to continue that. And then in my county, I said, well, gosh, I need to connect with my public. And so I wrote a blog about uh, my Victory 2020 garden program. And uh, Marion County saw that and called and said, hey, we're also doing something very similar. Maybe we should partner. And we're like, well, that's a great idea. So um, we decided, hey, you know, uh, why not? And then we, we invited um, Orange County to join us as well. And so uh, really it was Marion County, Orange County and Columbia County. And it ended up being 12 faculty members, like I said, that really got this program grow going. 
And it's not just horticulture agents. You're talking to the horticulture agents today, but we also have FCS agents who do our home food preservation talks. Uh, and we also incorporated 4-H agents because this, is, this program is for youth as well. So it encompasses everybody. But the objectives of our program were, there were a couple different objectives. The first one was um, really to address food insecurity. Okay, people were, were nervous. We can't leave our houses now. Um, what are we, you know, what are we gonna eat? How are we gonna do that? Uh, and people were, were interested in, in growing their own food. Two, um, we needed a way to connect with people. So we were trying to think of a different kind of way besides just our face-to-face -face classes. How can we keep that connection going? And then three, we knew that um, if people were isolated, they were going to need some kind of connection themselves. So we really wanted to come up with a model where they could continue to learn um, from each other, from us, and, and feel that connection that they might normally get in a class or if they were master gardeners working with other master gardeners, but that personal connection. So we, we had uh, several different um, you know, ideas to keep people learning. Um, and I'm gonna talk about those in just a second. All right, go ahead, Tia. So we got a lot of press at the beginning and you know, ours is called Victory 2020 Gardens, but they're really, they are based on the Victory Gardens of World War II. Uh, and that's, that's, again, kind of our basis or our historical inspiration, if you will, for our program. They had similar objectives. Um, so the uh, Victory Gardens or the original ones from the wars, their, their objectives were preservation, right? Uh, that sense of community, uh, and then addressing food insecurity. So very similar to ours. And so we, that picked up in the media quite a bit. So uh, you may have seen it on the media, but we've got, uh, here's one story, and then Tia, the next one. Uh, another one here is, um, again, providing tips. Uh, so we got, we, you know, we got a lot of press, and that helped us grow this program um, to what it is now. But these were based on the original Victory Gardens from World War II. Uh, again, we're kind of our, our historical inspiration. So let's talk about the actual program because this is, this is where we get excited about stuff. Um, and you guys, you can still join the program or the community. It is free to join. Um, and it's, it's a, you know, it's, everything we do is free within the program. Um, we don't ask you to, you know, you can, you can participate as much as you want or as little as you want completely up to you. But our first um, kind of thing that we did was we have an online self-guided um, module with eight mo learning modules that you can go into Canvas and uh, watch the videos. There's um, activities. We have uh, youth and adults, so it's broken into two. So if you do have uh, youth or you work with 4-H or kids, uh, we have a lot of activities for them as well uh, is housed there. But we have different modules. Uh, there's how to start a garden. We talk about fertilization, uh, pesticides, uh, weeds, for instance, soil building and soil health is a large uh, section that we talk about. And we do have guest speakers. Um, so in, in that case, uh, you'll see Dr. Uh, Daniel Treadwell. Uh, and uh, we also have Jay Capasso from the Columbia County uh, office speaking. Uh, we talk about harvesting and preservation as well. So there's, there's a, um, oh, and, and mental health in your garden too. So there's different modules that you can work through um, and, and take quizzes and um, there's some homework that goes with it if you choose to do that, but you can vis revisit it as well. So you can go back and forth if you, know, if you wanna take, watch half of it and then go back later, you can do that. But it is, um, like I said, self-guided and uh, just a vast knowledge uh, uh, or a resource that you can use. Okay, Tia. So one of the really cool aspects that we um, did, and I think this is one reason we were so successful with this program, is that we mailed out seeds <laughs> to every participant until we ran out of seeds. And this was really spearheaded by the Marion County Extension Office, um, but they sent out three sets of seeds so they would have sent out either cucumbers, corn, squash, or cowpeas. And um, they little, put them in little packages. They ma mailed out almost 5,000 seed packets to individuals, okay? So we had uh, 1,600, um, around 1,600 participants that actually received seeds. Now keep in mind, we, we have over 2,600 participants uh, now in the program. So not everyone did receive seeds but the first 1,600 that signed up did uh, receive those. 
Um, but it took a lot of work and those were mailed out. And then we actually, we were able to watch them grow um, on Facebook. So we have a Facebook group that I'll talk about in a second, but we did run out of seeds, but that doesn't mean that we've stopped encouraging people trading seeds. And um, we have found that uh, our Facebook group, that people are actually seed swapping on that group. So it's, it's been really fun to watch while we don't have seeds all the time. For just a second, I think she froze. Um, did I freeze? Yes, just for a second. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Um, the internet's being a little, a little crazy here in Columbia County. Okay. So let me, let me re go over that seed swapping again. Um, so we do have the seed swap on the Facebook group. Am I still there? <laughs> yep. Okay. Sorry, my screen went blank. Um, so we do have a, a seed swap on the Facebook group. And so individuals are, are sending that self-addressed envelope to each other and then they're able to switch seeds. Uh, so it's been working quite well and we are going to plan some formal seed swapping events where we can really encourage that on Facebook or through Facebook uh, so they can connect with each other. Right, Tia? Now we also did Zoom webinars. We did close to 30 different webinars last year um, and had um, really good results uh, that Maxine will talk about, but you can access these still. We did put them all on YouTube and you can see just, a, this is just a real short list of what we did, um, but designing a vegetable garden, organic gardening, that's the one Dr. Treadwell came and spoke about, um, pest control. We had Dr. Um, or Bob Hockmuth from um, our regional lab up here come and speak. And so we have irrigating your garden. Um, we even did things like gardening with chickens and beekeeping. Um, so some of the, the related topics, if you will. But you'll see there's two links on this slide. The, the link on the right, um, the bit.ly link, that one is if you wanna go directly to the YouTube channel. If you go to the, the site on the left, uh, the Google site, that one actually will take you to our, um, we have a website and it has the handouts along with the YouTube uh, uh, videos, okay? So you can, either one will get you to the video, but the one on the left has the handouts associated with the presentation. And some people like to have that. Um, so it's a nice little addition. Uh, and we'll talk about, we're gonna keep, continue these uh, this year. Um, I'm gonna let Maxine talk about those. But if you have questions about these, please let us know. Okay, go ahead. All right, so let's talk about that Facebook page because we just got a question I see in the chat about it as well. Um, so one of our, our big aspects of the Victory Garden community is our private Facebook group. And Tia is gonna give you the link at the end how to join our program if you would like, and you can have access to all of this along with our Facebook group, okay? So our Facebook group is the place where we really get to connect with our gardeners. And so it's in real time. Um, we're constantly checking it. Uh, and so, you know, we're, we actually, we, we really like it because they're not only learning from us, they're learning from each other. And so it gives them a chance to uh, ask questions. Um, it gives them a chance to celebrate uh, small victories or, or, you know, failures as well. Um, last year, we had one person I remember very distinctly because we were so excited for them but they posted their one cherry tomato. That was the first thing they had ever grown, right? Was this little tiny cherry tomato, you know, and it's next to these scrolls of people producing pounds and pounds of vegetables. But that was so exciting for that person because they grew their first little cherry tomato. Um, and it was such a huge success for them and a victory. And so we all celebrated with them. And so, you know, we, um, you know, we all cry together when somebody's um, vegetables get eaten by, um, caterpillars as well. So, you know, it's, it's a roller coaster of emotions, but, but it's like a family, it's become a family. We, you know, we, we've learned the people and what's going on in their lives and uh, in their gardens, especially. Um, and it was really helpful during COVID because I feel like, you know, they were like, I, I, my family's getting tired of me talking about my vegetables, but you guys never do. So um, it was, we got that comment a lot and we never will get tired. I think of, of uh, hearing about people's gardens. So uh, we've really enjoyed it. Um, 
And then one aspect that we, we started is the book club. Um, and we did this in conjunction with the Master Gardener um, Florida book, book Club. And I hope that you are a participant with Winty's group on this. Um, so they have, um, you know, book clubs, uh, it's a Facebook page, but we did discussions in between as well with our participants. Uh, and so we did Foodscape Revolution uh, with the state office, uh, pollinator friendly gardening. We've done how to grow more vegetables. And then right now um, they're doing composting for a new generation. They just finished that up. Um, and so I don't know that they've announced the next book yet. Um, you guys can put it in the chat if, if they have. Uh, but we, I don't think we're gonna continue our discussions unless it becomes something that, that our group really, really wants. But we do encourage you to, um, to do with the state office. Um, we also did a youth book club, which was fun. Uh, and that one is actually available on our Canvas site. So it's a video where they read tops and bottoms. And then we put some curriculum there. So it's a little bit different um, idea, but, but um, worked really, really well. Okay, next. And I think I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to Maxine now so she can talk about the results. Awesome, thanks, Erin. So I have to say that the youth book club was a lot of fun for me. My kids enjoyed that a lot. And um, I'm kind of hoping maybe we could further on the youth book club part of it. I enjoyed that. So a little on our results, like Erin mentioned, um, this was a very positive experience overall. Not only did we have an exceptional team of faculty and specialists to work with, but the group members were just, it was, it was a great experience for everybody. So we had a total of over 2,600 participants. Um, and this was spaced out over 40 states. And um, we ended up working in eight countries as well, including Costa Rica, Japan, Germany, uh, Kenya, Liberia, Canada, Mexico, and recently the Philippines. So we certainly weren't expecting that when this all started. Um, so I guess you could say we were working with a global Victory Gardeners program with a global pandemic going on. So I guess it's very fitting in that aspect, um, but it certainly wasn't what our original intent was, but it was really exciting to see some of the people from so many different zones working together all for the same purpose. And, um, you know, again, just like Aaron was talking about, I think it gave people a lot of relief from the ongoing situation and where our lives changed so drastically and suddenly. Um, being able to be a part of this group really gave them some value in their own backyards that they may not have had previously. So um, it was a lot of fun. Let's go on next to you. Thank you. All right, um, so as far as our participants go, we had um, 4, 1,446 members on our Facebook group, and this is still growing. Um, it is extremely active, and kudos to Erin for being able to keep up with that, because I know that our Facebook page for the Marion County Extension Office Master Gardeners um, is a full-time job to keep up with that, and I helped a little bit with the Victory Gardens Facebook page, but that has mostly been Aaron and Tia and some of the others. So um, way to go guys on that. But the posts on there, I do get the posts and they're phenomenal. It's wonderful to see what everybody's doing and the support that they provide each other um, and encouragement. They're really, we haven't had many issues, um, if any, with negative comments or negative feedback. It's been a very, very positive experience and very valuable information. So we've dealt with everything from stinging nettles and weeds to disease problems and pest problems. It's been a really good experience. So um, we did, as Aaron mentioned, approximately 30 Zoom workshops with 957 total participants. These were very popular. Um, and of course there were variable participants in each one, some days we'd have a couple hundred and some days we'd have 30. Um, but overall, they were very well attended and well received. And of course, we recorded them so people that couldn't make that specific time could go back and watch them at a later time. And then lastly, we had our eight module Canvas um, program, which I helped upload a lot of the participants into. And we had 1,877 Canvas students. So we had more than that that were entered, but that was the number that actually logged in and participated in the modules. So, um, and, and you can still do that. So it's still up and running. 
Um, we can email you the link. When we first started with this, it was a big learning curve because we didn't know how to get people registered very easily. So um, we were manually uploading them, which wasn't too bad, but uh, it's been a big learning curve, but we had a lot of success with this. And the differences between certain people that went through and watched each module and took the quizzes and other people that just picked and choose what they wanted to participate in, um, there were very extreme differences there, but it was a great program. Um, let's move to the next one, Tia. So the whole idea behind this was cultivating community. And uh, before I move on to that, I see there's a question on what are Canvas students. So Canvas is the platform that we had uploaded the modules into. And so what that is, is it's a program through the university, um, through IFAS, that we are able to access as extension agents. So it is actually where we were able to hold all the program materials. And so participants were able to register and log in, and then they could go in and do these programs online at their convenience. So, um, but it's, it's an online program is what Canvas is. So, um, so moving forward, we're talking about cultivating community. Um, our Facebook group was a separate platform from Canvas. So we had multiple different things going on at the same time, but all with that same membership group. Um, and this allowed them to connect to each other. So when you use Canvas, you could have um, like they could post certain questions in Canvas and they could post different notes to each other as a group, but that doesn't mean somebody's automatically gonna go read it. So with Facebook, you know, the members of Facebook were able to see the different posts and there was a lot more interpersonal communication there. So, um, you know, there were definitely positives and negatives and successes and failures. So um, just like we got the question of what is Canvas, you know, that a lot of people weren't familiar with it going in. And so the communication within Canvas was not nearly as second nature to folks as Facebook is. So Facebook was a really great way for people to connect with each other. So, um, and on the left here, Aaron's got a picture posted of a garden space that they were trying to clean out to get ready to plant some tomatoes and peppers and sweet potatoes. So um, this was something that they were able to get some advice from fellow members of the group on by posting on Facebook. Whereas Canvas wouldn't have allowed you to post a picture per se, and it would have allowed you to do a discussion. But again, unless somebody's physically going in and looking for that discussion, they probably wouldn't see it. So, and most people are much more familiar with Facebook. So that was a really good way to get people together. All right, so a few successes, as Aaron mentioned earlier, um, the first Everglades tomatoes ever for this particular individual. That was a big success and uh, we're really happy for them. They got some beautiful little tomatoes they could put on a salad or whatever, but um, having their first garden ever, you know, you'd be amazed at how many people haven't done this before. And um, first tomatoes, starting a compost pile, um, Tia did a program on saving seeds for us within our um, virtual workshops and webinars, and um, that was awesome. People love that, and I hope we're able to repeat that. I, we've been talking about that recently, but um, saving seeds is a big deal because last year, if you remember during the pandemic, getting vegetable seeds was not an easy feat. They were sold out online for months, and we weren't able to access them, so people that were able to save seeds from their own garden were able to protect that resource and keep it going for the next season. So that was really fun. And um, as many of you probably know, saving seeds can be one, valuable in that it saves you money, but two, if it's not done right, you don't get to keep the seeds because they end up moldy or rotten. And um, so there are some really important techniques to that. Um, growing plants from seeds was new to a lot of people. A lot of people go and buy their transplants from Lowe's and Home Depot. Um, it's much more fun to grow plants from seeds, in my opinion. You can play with so many different varieties, um, but this was not something that was uh, commonplace prior to the pandemic. So um, hopefully we really got a lot of good experience doing that. And again, successes and failures, of course, because if you don't start your seeds at the right time, or if you plant them too soon and they get sunburned, um, there's so many things that can go wrong with when you're starting seeds and then transplanting them. So, but everyone did such a great job. 
we had record numbers of harvesting for um, fruits and vegetables. And we tried to get some people to enter their weights um, through the Canvas program because that does give us a very reportable number. So um, that was great. Um, I hope we can continue this in the future and be able to, to get even more harvest. So a few of our failures here, um, we all know vegetables are hard to grow. This is not something that you can plant a seed and walk away and expect to just be able to get a harvest next time you go out. Um, it definitely doesn't work that way. So um, there were no shortage of failures, but most people took it very well and used it as a learning experience. I think that's one of the reasons many of us stay in gardening and horticulture is because it's all about trial and error. Um, there were many varieties that are not suitable for Florida. And of course, with this program going globally um, with eight different countries involved, some of our varieties that we discussed weren't gonna be appropriate for other areas either. So there were many different things going on with the different zones and we were trying to refer people to their extension offices that were closer to them. So that was very challenging sometimes. Um, we had a lot of insect and disease pressure as the pandemic continued into the summer. Um, obviously, as many, many of you know, as master gardeners, you know, when you start early in the season, you're going to have less insects and less diseases. But as you try to push that crop to maintain it through a longer period or longer stretch, you're going to end up with more problems. Um, and then also here in Florida, many of you probably have experienced our lack of nutrients with sandy soils. Our native Florida soils are not rich in compost or organic matter. So um, lots of different issues there. And then one of my favorite topics to talk about is of course wildlife and um, even domesticated pets. So having animal damage. Um, I know right now I have what I like to call my Chihuahua Saurus. Uh, thanks to one of my coworkers here in the office, I have a Chihuahua puppy at the house and he is demolishing my gardens. So um, the poor little thing has got teeth that must be like razor blades. But um, that's just one example of animal damage, but you can see in the picture, here's some other damage of some squash that got um, attacked, probably could be by a bird, could be by bugs. You just don't know, there's so many different things. So this was something I saw a lot. I saw some posts where um, rabbits had gotten into the garden. So, you know, with the suddenness of the Victory Garden program, as well as the pandemic, you know, a lot of people didn't have fences around their gardens. It wasn't something that they had planned for months in advance. And if you've ever worked with a community garden or school garden in, in the past, you know that usually we spend six months or longer planning this stuff. And we think about fences and we think about wildlife and other things. This was not that situation. This was a, hey, we really need something to get people's minds off of what's going on. Let's get it done. And so, and then it we worked with what we had. So there were definitely failures and that's okay. So a little bit on uh, what's coming next and an update on that. Um, we are planning to continue this program in 2021. In fact, we're getting ready to start it uh, next week, I believe. So yay, it's going to be super exciting. And I think I'm kicking off the workshop starting on March 31st. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit on prepping last year's garden beds some things to expect for the upcoming heat that we know we'll be seeing sooner rather than later. Um, Aaron is working on figuring out how we're gonna um, do seed swaps in a little bit more productive manner and help people out with that. Um, of course, the private Facebook group that Aaron has up and running is extremely productive and we're getting tons of posts on that already. Um, our YouTube page and website will be updated as we start doing new presentations. So feel free to check it out and look at some of the webinars that we've done both in the past and the ones that we've got upcoming if you can't make the 11 a.m. on Wednesday classes. So that's when we hold them. And people are just now starting to transplant and prepare their garden beds in North Florida. I know those of you that are further south probably already have them going, um, but many people are just getting them going. So this is a great time for us to start talking about um, planning ahead for troublesome spots that might be there thinking about um, seed saving for fall gardens or next spring. It's a great time to think about soil amendments, all of the above. So we're gonna try to cover as much as we can. So we really are looking forward to getting this going again. So this is the schedule that we have started for um, our current 
uh, webinar series that's coming up. So again, next week, we'll start it out with troubleshooting spring garden problems um, and prepping for our, our beds. We'll do April 7th, Gardening for Kids is gonna be Aaron. Um, I actually have one of my master gardeners, Machina Schlegel is gonna do herbs for us on April 14th. We're gonna do microgreens on April 21st um, and then seed saving with Tia on April 28th. And then May 5th, we're looking at doing summertime gardenings with solarizing and composting as an extra benefit there. So um, look for our registration links to come out very soon. Um, hoping this will go well. So, and then we also have food preservation classes. So um, these are being done in partnership with FCS. So if you don't know what our FCS agents are or who your local FCS agent is, that's our family and consumer sciences person. And again, they do a lot of food safety stuff. So um, March 23rd, they're gonna talk about strawberries. April 27th, they're gonna do peppers. Um, May 25th will be watermelon. June 29th will be tomatoes. July 27th will be sweet corn. And in August, they're gonna look at peanuts. So um, feel free to tap into those. Those are gonna be awesome. I really look forward to those myself. So, and we've got 4-H activities also going on here in Marion County. We do a program called Seminole Gardens. This program has been going on for more than a decade. Um, but this year we have really expanded it. We worked on expanding it last year um, and especially when the pandemic hit, but this year it's even bigger and better. So we have a total of 695 participants right now going through our Seminole Gardens program. This includes several schools. So it's all youth um, and families. It's 22 families total. They have to complete a record book. And at the end of it, they bring in some of their harvest and share it with their peers. So, or at least that's the plan. I'm not sure exactly how they're planning to do that with COVID still being here, but in the past, that's what we've done. Um, and then of course, um, hoping to continue with the youth book clubs with Aaron as well. So, but 4-H activities are a huge part of what we have going. And um, we hope that this will continue well into the future. All right, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Tia. Thanks, guys. All right, thank you, Maxine. So, hey, everybody. My name is Tia Silvesi, and I'm the Florida Friendly Landscaping Agent with the University of Florida Extension in Orange County. And like Wendy said, I'm passionate about edible plants. And, pardon the knock on the door. And um, so the Victory Garden fell right in line with my background, uh, planting vegetables and growing up on a farm. And some of you master gardeners, you might be a vegetable and edible plant specialist and other people kind of cringe when they have to diagnose some kind of disease on a tomato. So these are just some general tips of topics that we teach to our Victory Garden participants and that I wanted to share with you so you can be a better, you know, plant doctor and be able to better address people's plant questions when they come to you with, you know, vegetable problems or pests or disease stuff. And these are very general, so you might know a lot of them. Um, of course, we start with the Florida friendly principle number one, right plate, plant in the right place. So it's very important for vegetable gardening, what to plant when. When Wendy asked, what do you guys wanna plant? At the beginning of the webinar today, I saw kohlrabi, I saw potatoes, and I was thinking it's way too warm in Orlando to plant those vegetables. So I hope you live in North Florida. Um, kohlrabi, we usually plant in the fall here, like September, October, it likes very cold weather, or you can plant it in the early spring too, January or February. And potatoes also are something that we plant in the pretty deep winter, like around January. So they're just starting to come up as the end of our frost date is nearing, which in Central Florida is around February 15th, you know, it could be around March. So these are some great resources we have that you can be sharing with your uh, clientele. Um, of course, everybody knows the Vegetable Gardening Guide, which is now available in both English and Spanish. 
the Florida Master Gardener Program, they also put out these wonderful infographics pictured on the left, which is, you know, the edibles to plant in whatever month you're in. And um, this year they've added some more vegetables and fruits and some different stuff like pigeon peas and pineapple and passion fruit that you can be planting right now in your garden, you know, expanding more towards an edible landscape. And um, don't forget about Google, you know, UF IFAS, whatever your topic is, tomato spots on leaves, and that will help get you to the UF IFAS EDIS documents. It will help to get you to blogs and other fact sheets that are science-based information you can be sharing. And there's also a new Florida Fresh Veggie app, and we can put the link to that in the chat box. And you can go on there and it kind of has a, app version of what to plant when in Florida. So the right plant in the right place at the right time. Make sure you follow your planting calendars for your vegetables and plant your fruit trees in a place that matches for your site conditions. So number two is to select and grow varieties suitable for Florida. So um, some of the publications like the Florida Vegetable Gardening Guide, it has a list of specific varieties that are known to do well here in Florida. And also things with a kind of Florida name like Seminole Pumpkin, Everglades Tomato. You know, if it has a name like Everglades Tomato, it has to do well here in the heat and the humidity. And that's like one of the few tomatoes that will keep bearing all summer long. It doesn't care that it's 100 degrees out and 80% humidity. Um, rattlesnake pole beans, is there another one? And then some of the kind of Asian vegetables like Japanese eggplant or the Thai eggplant, like the long skinny ones, those do really well here. I'm not sure exactly why, but um, you can find some of those varieties. And there's more resources on these vegetables listed on our Google site that Aaron shared with you earlier. So number three is add lots of compost to the soil. So adding compost is the foundation for any good organic garden. But even if you're growing inorganically, it's always good to add compost to your garden because it has so many benefits. Um, vegetables especially can be kind of needy type of plants, needing a lot of fertilizer, needing a lot of water. And this compost helps to increase the organic matter in the soil, which provides food for beneficial microorganisms. Think about probiotics for your soil, helps keep the soil healthy, keeps the plants healthy too by fighting pests and disease. Um, then it increases the water holding capacity. It increases the nutrient um, availability to the plants. And although it's mostly organic matter, it does have a small amount of nutrients that it will release into the soil, but it's not technically you know, a fertilizer. There is no analysis of NPK on most compost bags. And so, you know, grow your own compost. We have videos in the canvas, in the Facebook, how to make your own compost pile, how to get that started, what to add to it. Or you can buy compost from the store, you know, black cow, horse manure. These are all good things. Really any kind of garden soil is probably better than the Florida sand that many people have in their yard. So constantly adding good stuff to the soil. I say, every time you're gonna prep your bed, top it off with some good soil. So number four is taking time to prepare your bed. And this is something I've seen really works. Don't just, you know, dig up the soil real quick, sprinkle a little compost on and go ahead and plant, but take your time to really mix the compost in with the existing soil. So put, you know, a couple inches of compost on, mix it in, put a little bit more on, mix it in again, you know, top dress it at the each planting season or even as your vegetable grows, for example, like your carrots, you know, if the soil level gets down below the root, the top of your carrots will turn green and not be that tasty. So keep that soil level up covering, you know, the roots. And then also fluffing up the soil and breaking up clumps. This can be part of your mindfulness and your stress reduction, going out 
into your soil and just breaking up those clumps because it's hard for the roots to enter in those large clumps of soil. It will help with the soil aeration and the roots being able to move throughout the garden bed and then remove any large roots or rocks. Not that we have too many of those in Florida, but you know, anything that could impede your garden from growing to the ultimate. So number five is plant carefully. Again, don't haphazardly just plant a bunch of seeds. What you should do is use fresh seeds and then choose quality plants like the varieties that will grow well here. And plant, you know, be dedicated about how you're gonna plant your seeds. So here we're growing a little squash plant and we planted two squash plants per the four inch pot. So we want really one plant per pot. And so aim for that for your tomatoes, for your peppers, for your squashes. And it's okay to plant multiple seeds per pot, but just know that you're gonna have to thin them or separate them later. Okay, and so when you actually go to plant it in the ground, you know, give the roots a little massage to loosen them, um, give them a little extra compost or fertilize after planting, after they get established with new roots, and then use some kind of mulch. That's another Florida friendly landscaping principle. And you can even mulch your vegetables. Um, you may not want to use wood chips. I prefer more softer and easier to decompose materials like some straw or your grass clippings or something a little softer. Um, that helps with your vegetables to keep some of that soil splash off of the leaf and prevent disease. So always water in your plants thoroughly and then check them after planting. And again, encourage people, if they have something that dies, just to replant and keep on planting until you find things that grow well and thrive in your garden. That's the key to success. So number six is nurture your garden. Don't just plant it and forget about it, but you know, check it daily. This is a great daily routine to go outside and check your plants for water, um, see if they need to be staked. Right now I'm pruning the little shoots out of my tomatoes, the side shoots. Um, nutrients may be needed for heavy feeding crops like tomatoes, um, peppers, corn, and check for pests and diseases. If you're growing something like a seminal pumpkin, um, you can do it organically with hand control, but go out there every day and look in that little baby leaf and check the plants for those little caterpillars. If you can just hand squish them, you know, every day or a couple times a week, that will help keep your, you know, pest pressure down. Um, watch out for diseases. If you have a plant that gets infected with a virus, you know, you want to pull that out and destroy it, you know, get that plant out of there so it doesn't infect other ones. And then watering is important too. So in our expansion garden, we have drip irrigation. We also demonstrate micro irrigation. Um, of course, we have in every county in Florida watering restrictions that mandate that you water before 10 a.m. or after 4 p.m. That way the water can sink into the ground you know, where it's needed and not be lost up into the air by the heat of the day. So be sure to know these in your area and follow them and let your um, extension clients know about that. Fertilizer is another important thing. So um, I like to use this organic garden tone fertilizer. Vegetables do need a little bit more phosphorus. And um, in Orange County, we have a fertilizer ordinance that states no phosphorus can be used, but that applies to turf and landscapes. And so vegetables and fruit trees are exempt. And um, it is good to get a kind of balanced fertilizer, like a 666 type for fertilizing your fruits and vegetables. And then special plants have special needs too. And this is more common in edibles, um, for example, fruit trees, citrus, they might need more micronutrients than your standard landscape and lawn plants. So pay attention, um, tell people to send you pictures of their plants. Um, 
and you can help diagnose what's wrong with them. And of course, don't fertilize before a heavy rain and always follow the label instructions. So tip number nine is to use integrated pest management. And so we encourage people, one, to learn to identify insects, scout for them, be able to know your basic ones like your ladybug. And if you have a question about your bug, then that's what you all are here for, to help answer these questions. Um, like in the bottom left-hand corner is that lacewing larva eating an aphid. So we also encourage ecological landscaping where you allow some of the pests to live in your garden. And aphids is a good example of that. You can just let the aphids be if they're not creating major damage. And then that will help to attract the good bugs, the beneficial insects, which will come and eat them. Uh, we tell people to spray only if needed and use natural or organic pest controls, the least toxic chemicals first, you know, before going to the more toxic. And of course, with any pesticide, um, read the label instructions and follow them. And you can help, you know, by interpreting that and giving people recommendations on exactly what to do, what to spray, how to do it. And options for other controls. There's a great EDIS publication on natural pest control that um, we share very often in the Facebook group. And number 10 is about sustainability and closing the loop. You know, doing some fundamental practices that will help keep your garden going year after year, um, lessening the imports and outputs. Um, for example, saving your own seed composting and recycling your kitchen scraps in your yard waste. And these are very simple things that everybody could be doing in their home. You don't need a big yard. You can grow plants from even the grocery store and you know get that cycle going and then share the seeds with your friends and your neighbors and you know teach them how to make plant cuttings and then that will help you know, build the resiliency of our community and our food system. So those are just 10 simple tips. Here's the link on how you can join us and sign up for the program. And again, when you sign up for the program, you will have access to the Canvas um, to do all those learning modules. You'll also be invited to join our private Facebook group. And we encourage you as Master Gardener volunteers, since you are so knowledgeable, to help us answer some of those vegetable gardening questions. And it can also be a learning experience for you if somebody posts something that you're not sure to try to look it up and see if you can come up with the right answer. And then usually um, somebody like myself or Aaron, you know, we're on there regularly too and, you know, double checking the answers and saying, yes, that's a great idea. You should do that or no, don't try that. Um, so it's a great way to interact with people and you can be helping us, you know, expand the reach of this Victory Garden program. So tell other people about us, you know, participate in our, our program and our Facebook and our Canvas and our seed swap coming up. And um, like Erin mentioned, this is more than just us three. There is a group of 12 faculty who have been on board conducting the Victory Garden program. And you can see our Zoom call. A lot of these people I haven't even met in person since we got together since the pandemic started. And you can see the list of all the faculty on the left-hand side. And special thanks to Wendy Wilbur, who's been very supportive of our program and helping us out and giving us some great suggestions how we can improve it. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for attending today and open it up for questions. Our email addresses are here. Feel free to contact us or your own um, agents in your county to learn more. Thank you all so much. This was excellent. It was just everything we wanted to hear about. We wanted to hear about the success of the program and, and how it all worked. Um, so I think a lot of folks are very interested in enrolling and finding out when these classes are and getting involved. Um, so um, I think we will post the appropriate links with the recording once we get it up um, and or 
Um, I can remail um, the promotional material to the extension agents and then they can um, access it that way. So, or if there's a quick way for you all to just say, oh, go to this um, spot, um, you can go ahead and say that now. I did put it in the chat box for the, the Join the Victory program. I, I did put it there um, so okay. they could certainly, certainly uh, join us that way, um, but we can always email it out again. Good, I'm gonna go ahead and put it in the chat box again. Please, so. and then if you um, decide to join the Facebook group, you can always join if you have a Master Gardener page or a county page, that page can also join the Facebook group. And that's what we, what we prefer to use when we answer, answer people's questions, um, just so that it is coming from the university. Uh, and then of course we're using, um, you know, your university um, recommendations. So uh, we do, do check that, but that helps a lot. Um, especially if you're down, you know, we've, we're, we're servicing the, the entire state. So um, especially if you're down, you know, in, in the Keys or the Panhandle, we focus more on Central Florida. So we can always use help in those areas for sure. That's, that's yeah. a really, that's a really important um, aspect to that because we do cover all of Florida. So um, we had a question, what if you're not on Facebook? I think you can still participate, right? Absolutely. So you can join the, the Canvas um, you can still watch the all the online modules if you do the Zoom programs, which you know you're on today. So that means you have access to that. Um, that would be another way. You're just not a, not going to get the daily um, communication that we might have. Uh, and then we are setting up a um, a listserv through um, where we can just email everybody as well. So we're hoping that we'll get more information out um, that people aren't on Facebook because about half of our group is not. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and then someone asked if they will get a hard copy of the webinar. Yes, we're going to post the PDF of this webinar along with the recording on the Master Gardener website. And then um, uh, one of the persons uh, was very interested in the Everglades tomato and um, it's just a kind of an old heirloom Florida favorite. And, and um, I'll, I'll mention, I'll, it's just super vigorous and you get uh, tomatoes that are about the size of the tip of your pinky. Uh, would you all like to comment a little bit more on those? I think we all grow them. <laughs> it's one of our, it seems to be one of our favorites, I think, that um, our, our group grows. Yeah, somebody said very tasty. They, they're, they're like little sugar bombs <laughs> on your mouth, I think. Mm -hmm. um, depending on where you are, uh, that person's at, you know, if, if I know my area, we've got some seeds. So if, if you're in Columbia County area, we'll certainly share with you. Um, if you're interested in growing any of those. And I think usually Marion County has some at their, are you on a plant sale, Maxine, this year? They usually have some. He's unmuting. Oh, and somebody's growing the Seminole pumpkin, also one of my favorites. Yes, so I, I, have a, I have a question for Tia and for the crowd. Should I go ahead and plant my Seminole pumpkin seeds now? Where are you located? I'm in Gainesville. <laughs> Yes. It's me. <laughs> oh, you. Yes. Yes. We're planting them now. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay. I thought yeah. so. You yeah. can plant now or you can wait a little bit. Like right now, my garden is so full of beans and squash mm -hmm. and cucumbers and corn. I'm going to wait for like another month, but you can plant them beyond the first date of, um, you know, last date of frost all the way up to like July 1st. Okay. Thank you very much. I think I will do a stagger planting. I was just going to say staggered planting for those would be would be awesome. Um, yeah, and I hear they get less pests if you plant them earlier. Okay, that's right. That's right. Erin, mm -hmm. I was finally able to unmute. Sorry, I've got three screens up here and I could not get my cursor to go to the one I needed. So um, we do not have any Everglades tomatoes here in Marion County right now. We are doing our plant sales every Thursday from nine to noon by appointment. Um, but I, I was asked last week for some Everglades tomatoes and I don't have any right now. I'm very bummed. Okay. Yeah, well, you can look for them on seed catalogs online. Yeah, yeah. we'll have a few at our plant sale uh, up here in a couple weeks, but um, yeah, just watch that Seminole pumpkin because it goes everywhere. You don't need a lot of them. Um, Jenna okay. said, one is the ground cover, which is how I use mine. And, and actually this year, I'm going to do a little bit more, hor more like a historical planting they used to plant them in the trees and um, along the river. So I'm actually gonna try mine in some trees and see how that goes. I don't know if I can harvest them, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna try it, <laughs> so. Yeah, I grew them in the trees. I'll send you a picture, Erin. Okay, great. <laughs> I might try that too. 
Um, Susan Cushman is recommending seedsavers.com as a great source for seeds. And I would encourage people to also check in their local libraries because a lot of them have seed banks going on. Um, and I think I'm gonna ask to have a seed bank uh, webinar from the seed bank group in IFAS. Uh, I know Teresa Badurik does a great one as the, the Tallahassee, uh, Tallahassee Master Gardeners do as well. So I wanna do that. Um, Vava said that uh, the Everglades tomato is actually a different species. Um, so Solanum pimpinella folium. So um, that's a nice tip for you all to know about that. Um, very good. And Deborah says, do you have any seeds to send us to Palm Beach County? It sounds like you don't have any seeds to send right now. Is that true? We had somebody that was giving away seeds the other day. Um, I don't know if they have any more. Um, I don't know, Tia, if you have any more. Um, we're going to do, if you get on our website, we are um, going to be encouraging a seed swap very soon, but we're not sending them out like we were before. Very good. Very good. Uh, we have another question. Can you plant the Everglades tomato from the fruit? As long as you're not growing other tomatoes, right, Tia? She's our, she's our local seed saver. Yeah, no, you can plant it from the fruit. Um, it is like an heirloom, so you can save the seeds and it will be come true to like the parent type. Um, you know, Kathy asked where, how do I get seeds for Everglade tomato in Cape Coral? Um, the Echo Farm in outside of Fort Myers, which is close to Cape Coral, I think, um, would be a good place to go look for that and other heirloom seeds. So that's Echo outside of Fort Myers is where I would look, or you can look on their website as well. And we did do a seed saving workshop last year, and it is on our YouTube channel. Um, and, and somebody asked about the strawberry a video that is also on that same website. So let me repost that so that you guys can get to that. It sounds like all we need to, um, you know, get an Everglades tomato, you know, push going on and get some seeds to every extension center and then they can spread them from there. I think it's a really great idea. And I think we've kind of done that a little bit with the Seminole pumpkin um, kind of making, the more we grow, the more we can capture, the more we can share, which is really what we're all about in the Master Gardener program too. Um, so Maxine, if your address is your birthday, happy birthday tomorrow. It's not, but thank you. <laughs> it's, her, it's her zip code. <laughs> It is my old zip code. I've had that email since I was 16 years old. <laughs> oh, gosh. Back we've in the day. Fun. Well, you all, it's two o'clock and we've had some great conversations, some great discussion. I can't thank you enough for sharing this program, for doing this program so expertly, um, for uh, really responding to the need that folks wanted to grow their own food and feed, feel more food secure, and to then gain the confidence to, to grow their own edibles and to provide for themselves and their family. So you all were so instrumental in doing that for Florida's population with Victory 2020 Garden. So thank you all very much. And uh, the recording uh, will be uh, on the website soon along with the uh, posted resources. And remember to take the Qualtrics quiz as you sign out. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having us. The pleasure. Thanks, guys.